Thank you. Hello, hello. There we go. And stare boldly into the future like this. It's about right. You ready to hit the laptop thing? I tried it. Laptop one? Oh, your laptop one. Boom. There we go. I'm Dave Path, and I'm a producer at WGBH in Boston. And uh, like uh, during the introduction, we just said, we're going to talk about one of the projects we have going on there, which is called Design Squad Nation. It's been going on for uh, five years now, uh, five, four seasons on TV and a new one coming up online. And, you know, it's nice to think that I produced the show, but there's a huge number of people that produce the show and the website and all the education materials. And more than just talking about this one particular project, I want to make sure that we're talking about design um, as a way of helping people learn and how, and how you as designers or creative people can sort of inspire that next generation of designers, of engineers, of creative people to do what you do and uh, to do it better, hopefully. Um, not because you're not great, because you are. But, you know, you got to move forward. In the beginning, I want to say that, you know, if you're an engineer, who's, is anyone here an engineer right now? Yes. Okay, listen. Y look at this equation here. It's really important to see this. <laughs> okay, no matter what you, know, you look at on TV and what the Big Bang Theory says, or whatever else is, that you are not lame. Engineers are not lame. They're fantastic. They've made everything that we see around here exist the way that it is. And just take that to heart. But it, well, if you are lame, it's not because you're an engineer. It's because of some other problem. <laughs> you should ask your friends. They'll probably tell you what, what's up with that. But um, yeah, that's important to keep in mind. Um, real quick about WGBH, if you haven't heard about what that is. It's a PBS station here in Boston. We make all kinds of shows that go uh, across the country, across the world. Antiques Roadshow, if that's your thing. Arthur, if that's your thing. Uh, back in the day, Zoom. If anyone's here is local from a long time ago. Zoom was a GBH show. So all kinds of PBS stuff, all kinds of educational media. And we also make all kinds of websites, too. So for all those shows, a whole department of people that, that make interactive material for online, on, on uh, mobile platforms, and so on. Uh, lots of great games, lots of websites, of which Design Squad is one of those things. So that's where, that's where we're coming from. It's a, been around for a, a long time now, and we're still kicking out great educational media um, for, all, for all ages. But in particular, we're going to talk today about uh, Design Squad Nation. And this is a, a, a project that we're going to sort of step through how it's evolved over time, actually, how it's, how it's changed over the years, and sort of what the main message is. So it's an online, it's, it's a website, it's an online community where kids are able to submit their own creative ideas, respond to each other's creative ideas, and watch a show which sort of demonstrates what it is to, to solve problems using the design process. So it's again, engineering is not lame, design is not lame, it's something anyone can do, and you can do it at home too, and here's how we're going to help you. So that's what this, this sort of website's about right now. Um, let's start with a super heavy question, which is way too heavy for this time in the morning, which is why are you even here right now? Answer probably is free coffee and bagels, but the second reason has got to be something else. Why are you here? You're creative people. How many people here consider themselves to be a designer that are in the house right now? I assume most. Sure. Okay, creative person in general. Everyone should be creative, right? Why, why is it that you think of yourself like that? You know, when did that start, sort of? Um, so let's go, let's go back in time. Let's teleport back in time. <laughs> this, is, this is a time machine invention from the Design School website, by the way, by What's It 16. Teleport way back, apparently to 1995, which is the oldest time this person can remember. But let's go back. <laughs> let's go back in time even further to when you were making things like this. This is probably how it started. This is why you're here right now. It's because probably you had some crayons, or you had some Legos, or you had something at home that made you excited to make things. It wasn't about impressing a client. It wasn't about, you know, I don't know, trying to make yourself feel awesome just because you want to have a career success or whatever it was. It was just fun. Design was a fun thing to do. It was fun to make stuff. It was fun to build with Legos. Like, what happened to that? Hopefully you still got that magic, but not everyone does. Let's go um, back uh, even further in time, here's another time machine right here, way back into the past, and think a little bit about what it means to, to, learn, to learn and design for learning, way back to 1916. So here's a super old idea. 
No thought, no idea can possibly be conveyed as an idea from one person to another. Only by wrestling with the conditions of the problem at first hand, seeking and finding his own way out, does he think. So there you go. Way back 1916, Dewey says, the way you figure out how to make something, how to understand something, is by, is by doing it, to get in there with your hands and figure it out for yourself. And way back in the day also, classrooms you know, looked like this, which actually looks exactly like we look right now and the way our schools look elsewhere. And schools are great. I don't want to, you know, there's plenty of people who are criticizing public education and what that means. And yes, there are problems, but schools and teachers do a wonderful job um, for the most part, I would say, and have a lot of material to cover. But this isn't the only format that, you know, can inspire learning. Look, they're happy. They're smiling in there. They're not, like, depressed that they're in school, at least right now. Here's another old idea while we're in the past for a minute, which is, uh, does anyone recognize this, this phrase? Anyone know what this is? Maybe not. It's, it's, it's from the arts and crafts movement, um, which was turn of the century America. And it's uh, designers that make great furniture. Anyone who likes to make furniture should look that up at some point. Um, and it, this is a, sort of a paraphrased quote from someone named John Ruskin, who said, a belief in working with the head, the hand, and the heart, and mixing enough play in with the work so that every task is pleasurable and makes for health and happiness. So another super old idea that is still relevant right now. Hand, head, heart, working together to make something new. So let's blast forward into the future, back here at Time and Space. And here's another quote from someone that we know right now, Obama here, telling us to think about new and creative ways to get people involved in science engineering to be, to be makers of things, not just consumers of things, because our future depends on it. So just so you know, your future depends on your ability to do this. All right, enough quotes. Um, the problem hasn't been solved, obviously. As we think about what we do at WGBH, it's because you know, education hasn't been solved. You may have heard about that in the news. People still got to figure out new ways to help people learn. Um, even though Dewey identified earlier, it's a great idea to get people to do hands-on stuff. Still, there's still a need to get more people involved in that. So let's talk about, let's talk about Design Squad and let's talk about how we've tried to do that and evolve the site over time, evolve the project over time to solve that challenge. Here are three things that you can do to help someone learn. And I think this applies to design broadly, not just to educational stuff, but to what you all are doing too. You've got to help them make room in their heads. You've got to help them learn by doing. And you've got to help them keep going. So let's take those one at a time. Let's talk about making room first right now, which is an important thing to keep in mind that when someone takes on a new idea. If you want to tell them how to do something new, if you want to help them work through a new, um, do wayfinding or, or uh, understand your point of purchase, whatever it is, they've already got something else in their minds already that you have to acknowledge uh, before you start. So like, two quick anecdotes to sort of touch on this. One is on the right hand side. This is a photograph from my wife who teaches in Boston Public Schools in kindergarten. And she told me that uh, they're on the uh, playground one day and the kids who were out there found um, a worm, and they brought the earthworm to her and said, look, hey, look, it's a, it's a, it's a snake, you know, holding the worm in their hand. And she said, well, yeah, that's, okay, well, that's actually a worm. It's a worm. And she said, and then the kid turns to the kids and says, yeah, but it's a baby snake, is what they said. <laughs> okay, so the snake idea had, like, totally taken over any other idea that was vaguely related to what that meant. So anything that looks squiggly, snake, period, you know. Already in their head. This one on the right hand, the right hand side here is um, uh, something called My Own Private Universe. It's a video that was done, you can tell, in the 80s um, <laughs> at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And they asked kids in school and asked Harvard graduate students if they know how the seasons work. Why do the seasons change? Does anyone actually know why the seasons change? I want to say it in public, why that is probably not. It won't make you do that. But they think, people think that it's because of the sort of the, the way that the Earth orbits around the sun. Like when you're closer to the sun, it's hotter. Or when you're farther away from the sun, it's colder. And that's not true. It's because of the tilt of the axis towards the sun. That is relatively circular. But even after you explain it to somebody, even if you ask a Harvard grad what's up with that, they don't give it up. It's really hard to convince someone that it's not, it's not because of this existing idea of the going farther away and coming back again. So it's hard to get something in someone's head. You can't just do it. They have to unbuild and then rebuild it in. Here's another picture here. Who's this? Great, it's a great crowd for this question. Um, here's an idea. You don't have to look like this to be a designer, though you can. <laughs> you can have a little dog and, and you know, awesome glasses and whatnot and, and be a designer, but you don't have to. Okay, who's this? Bonus points. Buckminster Fuller. Two for two, very good. You don't have to look like this to be an engineer, I'll tell you that. 
Something about the glasses, that's the unifying theme. And being in black and white is also key to, to being future-y. Um, but this is the problem, because kids think about being an engineer or being a designer, and they picture this kind of a thing a lot of the time. And that, that's an idea that we have to help them, and you have to help them unlearn so they can see themselves as being able to do that kind of work. So back to Design Squad. The show was launched to combat that problem exactly. It's about showing kids in action, doing engineering, solving problems that look like you look like at home, not like Buckminster Fuller and Andy Warhol, as great as they are, and they, and they were great at what they do. Not the only way to be. So this actually is an old picture of the website. This is from several years ago. So we launched the show, and in, during, the, um, during the season, uh, a number of kids would get together. It was a reality show competition. They get a challenge from a client. This one was to help, um, there we go, this t-shirt shooter build one of these. There was a dog rescue boat that was earlier. This is a, you know, <laughs> you can, dog sled, obviously. This is for, it was a Nerf thing. This is a barbecue spit that turns on a bike. We got some boats. And so they go through this intense process. They have a time limit to solve the challenge. They're doing a real thing. And instead of a competition, it was great. And through that experience, they're changed. And that's a big deal. This young woman here now works at Apple uh, Computer. Um, but in the beginning, they don't think they can do it. They go through this sort of intense summer of, of being on the show and working as a team and solving these problems. And then they're changed. You know, their, their, their emotional outlook on what it is to make something, their confidence is built up, broken down, and built up again, and they, and they change their attitude. And we've had lots of people on the show over the years, lots of uh, really talented young people working with engineers. Um, in the most recent season, Adam and Judy up there in the right-hand corner, those are designers and uh, engineers from IDEO. And they were on the show for a season. And we had all kinds of kids uh, participate and in, in be building things. So that's, that's, sort of making, that's the making room thing. <coughs> um, figure out what's already in their heads, figure out how to how, what needs to be unlearned to learn the new thing, and then give them that new time to build that new, new identity. Learn by doing. Here we go. Design process. Everyone in this room probably has, does this every day, many times a day. Identify the problem, brainstorm, design, build, redesign. Have the client tell you it's terrible. Go back to identify a problem again because they told you a fake problem to begin with. And now you have the real problem and go through the process again. That seems to be, you know, tricking some, some, some memories for everyone in here. And you can see, so every show is about the design process. The team goes through the whole thing. Um, one way to help kids online, this is sort of our problem, is to think about, okay, everyone can't be on the show, unfortunately. What can we do for kids at home? Well, one thing we can do is make a game. Make a game about the design process. This is a game called Fidget we built a couple years ago, which is uh, very similar to all kinds of physics-based sort of puzzle game, sandbox style games you might see online, where you drag and drop parts. The goal is to get these little guys called fidgets to bounce around and get in the right boxes at the bottom. Um, and sort of sort them or whatever. And it doesn't have to feel like this hard design process thing, but you have to because you, you have to put the pieces into the right place. Um, you have to do tweaks and make sure they're bouncing the right way. But it gets kids realizing that, guess what? First answer is not the last answer. You're not going to get it right the first time. But it doesn't make that feel like a whole horrible experience, we hope, for the most part. But that's a big deal. Learning by doing means that. So on the website, we had Fidget. We had all kinds of videos in the show, which you saw some clips of before. And this is sort of Design Squad version number you know, 1 or 0.5. But um, sort of the problem was that we didn't really have a way for kids to participate really in the design process. Playing a game is great, but it's limited. Well, how can we help them to share their own creativity with, with the rest of the world? So we did some paper testing. We went old school. We made a little clicker out of a piece of paper and had the kids put it on their finger. That's a ring right there. And we showed them some paper comps, which I'm sure you all do as well, and say, OK, let's, let's go through some stuff. We had them draw. One of the questions was, if we give a kid a blank sheet of paper and ask them to share a design idea, are they just going to feel like, uh, what? You know, I can't, you want me to draw in front of you? Is it going to be a performance anxiety thing for them? We didn't know, so we tested it out. And we found was that by giving them a, a very familiar prompt, like a shoe, for example, it was, it was great. It was immediate. Yeah, of course I want to draw all over this shoe and make it better and make like a rocket coming out the back or like hover shoes on the bottom. I can't tell you how many hover shoes and rocket shoes <laughs> I've seen over the past five years. If you can make one of those, by the way, you will be instantly wealthy. I guarantee it. So yeah, we gave them a prompt. We gave them a little nudge. It's not about show us your most amazing, mind-blowing design idea, kid. Go. It's make a shoe better. You know, and that prompt 
uh, we found was much more successful. So we sort of relaunched the website and made a space for kid stuff in here. So it's not just about the show, it's not just about us, it's not about me and the rest of the team, media producers trying to you know, steal the show, it's about putting kid stuff up there right along with, with the rest of the stuff and making it part of the community. So there you go, we had um, the fortune of having a lot of submissions. This is the earlier, again, earlier version of the website. You can upload a picture, you go to the sketch pad, put a bunch of uh, drawings in there, and we had lots of really fun, really um, funny and creative drawings. Okay, moving along. Um, then we decided to redo the show again. So the whole show for three seasons was about kids in a garage, reality show, it's like Junkyard Wars, it's like Project Runway competing with each other. Then we were kind of like, you know, reality show is not all that there is in the world. Let's do a different kind of a show. So Design Squad Nation came along. I'm Adam Bolton. And I'm Judy Lee. We're the hosts of Design Squad Nation. Woo! I have no idea what we just did. Design Squad Nation is a show about making kids' dreams come true through engineering. This is awesome. As professional engineers, we use our know-how to help kids across the country <laughs> and around the world to design and build some pretty cool creations. Wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> We help an aspiring pastry chef make a cake with moving parts for her first big event. I want to show the world what I'm made of. Hit it. It's the most beautiful cake I've ever seen. I'm very happy. I'm proud of myself. We work with two young fashion design students to create fantastic gowns for a major New York fashion designer. I'm excited. It'll start off short like that. Oh, amazing. And then it'll fall and this will be there. Oh, look at that. This is amazing. I really like it. Very creative. To experience this was one chance of a lifetime. And we work with skateboarders on an Apache reservation to build a skate park. <laughs> Let's do this, guys. I'm glad that I was part of it because it really means a lot to us. Together, we find innovative solutions to some real-world problems. It'd be great if we could think of a way to transport fresh produce to local restaurants. It's definitely going to change our community for the better. Wow! That is amazing! Mission accomplished, guys! The Science Coordination shows that engineering is everywhere. And it lets you be creative take risks, and make a difference in people's lives. Watch Design Squad Nation to see engineering in action on PBS stations across the country. I felt like we just won the Super Bowl or something. So there you go. There's a little slice of Design Squad Nation. Um, you can watch all those online, by the way. So the idea is that, okay, we've done a show where it was in a garage, it was in a studio space, and we sort of manufactured some challenges for kids to take on. But guess what? There's all kinds of stuff out in the world um, that, that need to be solved. There are real kids who really want to achieve something, make their dreams come true. So let's make the show about going out there and working with them to make that happen, sort of like a, a mini apprenticeship model. So that was Design Squad Nation. It was one season on, on PBS. Saw a lot of great things in there. Saw the Red, uh, Red Bull Fluke Talk competition. You saw the uh, robotic cake thing. Um, really fun. Um, and on the website, we had to change things too. So it was before it was about you know in the studio solving a problem. Now it's about out in the world working with kids to solve the problem. And to match that, we kind of have to change what the website's about. And I can also say that you know one of the things we did was make sure that when we're thinking about the messaging. We're making you know this is engineering. That's not a thing you would say look in a magazine and be like yeah engineering. That's what it's about. Um, but it is. It's, it's it's very true. Fabric engineering, electronics in, in, in fashion, it all goes together. So that's the message we're trying to send. And we also made some changes to the, uh, to the online community. Instead of kids just submitting their sketches, here's my sketch, here's my sketch, here's my sketch. Now you say, I wish that this could be different. I wish for the hoverboard. You know, I wish for a way to feed my pet where I'm gone. I wish for you know, a, a cake that moves, for example. And then other kids can respond to those wishes. So you submit an idea, someone else makes a sketch to sort of solve your idea, and the, the design process goes like that. And we, honestly, I didn't know if this was going to work at all. I didn't know if kids would be interested in responding to each other's ideas. I didn't know, we didn't know if, 
if it would make sense to them at all. And I'm very thankful that for the most part, it did. And we've gotten, we've gotten tons of great ideas coming from the, from the community. If you need a new design idea, by the way, I recommend you go on here and just solve one of these problems. <laughs> We'd be honored to have one of your drawings in here. It'd be so cool. So you can see just, just a snapshot I took of, of um, you know, a huge list of ideas that are in there. Some big ones, some small ones. You know, uh, I wish for a balloon launcher, achievable. I wish there was a way to solve the world's energy problems. Maybe a bit more long-term goal going on there. <laughs> But if you have the answer, just post it in there, and I'll make sure that the right people see it. <clears throat> I wish to turn trash into something useful. So this is one of the episodes where we had a contest, you know, um, recycle something and make it into a new invention. And we posted the video on the site and let other kids, not just the kids on the show, respond to that same challenge. Um, and it keeps going. Here's some other my favorite recent ones that were submitted. Uh, the glow cake is a cake that glows in the dark and sings happy birthday and the smile moves when it sings. Great idea, great idea, achievable. Here's a mini, mini monster. It's a grabber type invention. Here's a diary with an alarm. This is a diary alarm. It watches your diary so no, no one will look in it. Let's you just say, let's just say to keep little or big brothers and sisters away. And if I did see someone trying to look in your diary, it sounds an alarm. Thanks for looking. There you go. <laughs> There you go. This is a table that made, made out of newspaper. It's one of the things he posted on the site. So you can roll up newspaper and make a table out of it. And then here's a demonstration of it holding easily two phone books. Glow in the dark socks. Great idea. This is a robot maid, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> Under the door. You'll f this is uh, feeding your cat. You fill it with cat food and push start, and it will shoot the food out. There you go. Under the door. A better leash. My design is a better leash. It can pick up your dog's business. I tested out. I tested out, but it didn't work. Then it worked. I was very glad of myself. There you go. Design process in action. First design with a better leash didn't work. Second design worked. Success. Um, here's a more sophisticated one. A beautiful drawing of paper mache furniture made out of comic strips, which is actually totally marketable. I wouldn't be surprised that already exists in the world somewhere. Great idea. And one of the things we tried to do is, well, you know, the internet is full of sites where you can like or dislike something. Um, what can we do to provide encouragement for kids without making it, you know, so that kids are being mean to each other? We want to encourage positive reinforcement, not negative discouragement. So we did stickers. If you like something, give it a sticker. There you go. End of story. And we try to make it fun. And, and uh, kids, you know, like giving stickers. I do too. So there you go. There's a snapshot of what's going on in the online community right now. I'll just breeze through a couple more things. Keeping going, here's sort of where I'm we're ending up here. The heart, you can make room in someone's mind, you can help them learn by doing it, but once you step away, how do you keep anyone going with, with what you've done, uh, with any learning enterprise? What is it that keeps you sp spurring you on? Uh, what's gonna make the product you're designing usable again and again? And for design, one thing, one big, big thing is that you have to let people know that failure is absolutely required. And this is the hardest thing to sell <laughs> to kids, uh, if you, as you might imagine, is that it's a bummer when something doesn't work. And it's hard to sort of get past that. Here's a super brief clip is, is, is one yeah, moment in the show about that. Okay. This is them designing so this one, furniture for Ikea. This one is going to be the basketball hoop. Then there are going to be sm three smaller ones under it. This one's going to have the hooks for coats. This one is going to be the shelf. And this one is going to be a picture frame. You know what your design is in your head, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh. mm. Redraw it so I can understand it too. So we have, this is in between the closets, closets in the boys' room. Mm -hmm. We have a top hexagon okay. that has a basketball hoop on it. So then we have other hexagons coming out from right here. What about this fits with a nautical theme and will speak to an eight-year-old boy that walks into the Ikea and says, Mom, I want to get that. How sad are you guys on this? We are. We're just having issues with the measurements right now. I think... Um, I think... Really? If we get that sorted out, I think we can really... make one. I'm worried about for this your thing. concept. If it's just a jumble of features stuck together, like any project, that's not going to fulfill your overall concept if it's not well thought out. So, think about that and try and use your time wisely. Okay. I honestly Thanks. don't think it's going to work. I mean, it's like going to be a hunk of cardboard on the wall. Do you want to keep this? No. <laughs> well, okay, clean slate. Okay, so 
Okay. Put your tools down, design squads. That's All right, so that's a tough learning moment there, but an important one. It's like the first draft just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not the way design works for the most part. Uh, maybe if your Buckminster Fuller it works that way, but I don't think so. Another problem besides failure is just understanding terminology. A lot of great websites, we love Instructables, we love Make, they do great things, but some of them are really hard. They involve things called resistors, which kids don't really know what that's about yet, but it certainly could do. So we're trying to think about, okay, moving forward, what's a way we can get kids sort of up to speed and get in the process more than just sketching, but actually building physical things. We've already got a lot of materials on our website right now that are, are great activities for school. These, these work well in after school settings, but they weren't really clicking for a home user. We've had some success spurring people to try designs for contests. Like if you give away a prize, people get much more excited about designing something. I'm sure that's true for you guys too. And I want to share with you super quick um, one of the uh, prize winners there. I'm Robert Sill. I'm Kayla No. And I'm Paul Poulos. And we decided to take the Design Squad Project's String Thing online game to the next level. Here we've made a foot by foot and a half sound boxes made from plywood. Um, it's to emulate a guitar. The strings are made from rubber bands. And we've placed markers here all over to change the pitch of each note. The higher it goes, the higher the note. The lower the marker goes, the lower the note. And we will play for you J.C. Joyous Man Desiring by Bach. <laughs> There you go. Bravissimo. Very good. So if you get the right inspiration, you know, kids will go to bat and make things that just totally blow you away. So how do we, looking forward for the site, we haven't been successful in really aspiring this groundswell of hands-on building yet. Um, we know that the, the ground is ripe. So what do we do next? Well, here's um, a quick look at um, a new way to approach building something. This is going to be... Uh, and this is a rough cut of the video we're working on right now. I'm Deezy from Design Squad, and I'm with Eleanor, David, Andy, and Elliot. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we are going to repurpose this vacuum cleaner. Repurpose means using an item the way it was not designed to be used. Normally, this is used in your everyday life to suck up unwanted dirt. If you're going to do some activities with a vacuum cleaner, like we are, you should always have an adult present. Oh, that looks pretty cool. I love how like, each ribbon goes at a different time. This vacuum is a fan inside a box. The fan is pushing the air in this direction, so then the air collects the dirt. We're going to repurpose it and switch the hose around from here to here, so it therefore blows air out. I think not all vacuum cleaners actually do this, so check with your vacuum cleaner. Check with your vacuum cleaner. <coughs> We're going to use the blowing capability of our vacuum cleaner and make a air hockey table. Eleanor and David are using cardboard, a plastic bag, and some tape. It's a proof of concept of an air hockey table. Proof of concept is testing the idea. It's just a small part of it so we can actually see if the bag system actually works. Oh. Ah! <laughs> We have this big nice so there you go, a little bit of failure, but moving along. This light box has double thickness cardboard. We hope it's going to work better because it maybe won't curve. Let's try uh, one inch apart for each hole. We're going to put the vacuum right in here and also apply air to the table. There we go. <laughs> so there you go, a little vacuum cleaning repurposing. So that's one way to do it, is to show something that's, we're hoping this is going to be appealing to kids at home. Who doesn't want an air hockey table? I know I always did. It's still an unfulfilled dream for me. Um, but with a vacuum cleaner and some, some tape and a cardboard box, maybe you can do it. Here's another way to do it, is to sort of get someone to rethink and see sort of a engineering as a stunt. So here's a, a brief 
a brief engineering related stunt for you. I want to see how many yellow sticky notes it takes to hold my body weight off the ground. If you're using a perfect shear in just the way the tape is meant to be used. So what I've done is made a little sling and have that adhesive strip be pulling in perfect shear along the pull-up bar. Shear is when you push one thing across another. Watch what happens when I try to shear this tape across the table. During testing of this clip, one kid said, he's like obsessed with tape. It's true. I think it might work. One foot off, pulling hard with my arms. Two feet off, I'm holding myself up with sticky notes. There are exactly 20 sticky notes total holding my body weight of 160 pounds, and one of them even came off, so it's even a little more than 16 pounds per sticky note slength. That's almost eight pounds per sticky note itself. This is incredibly robust. Wow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it had to happen sometime. That was awesome. That was awesome. It was awesome that he could do pull-ups and math at the same time, which is... <laughs> Pretty impressive in and of itself. So um, these are both rough cuts. There's still a lot of changes made. You've got to make sure it's safe for kids at home as well. Um, kids also ask, is he cheating? Looks like his foot's on the thing at the end. Like They really were grilling us on the, uh, the le legitness. It's good. You've got to be skeptical of YouTube videos. You know what's going on. So here's a, a quick look at where we're headed for the website. Again, it's a draft in progress, which I didn't ask my designers for permission to show to anybody. Um, but it's all about getting kids to see the world as something they can design too. Watching videos like that, trying it at home, posting on the site, and then, then finding, finding a connection to the material that relates to what they already like. I already like sports. I already like fashion. I already like making stuff uh, in the garden. I already like art. And then finding the right things that match their existing interests. And then through that, we're hoping to sort of spur them on because it's linked to something that's personal to them, linked to their identity, to keep going past failure because they just love it so much. So that's the, that's the grand hope. We're going to be sort of relaunching the website um, in August this year. And you'll see a lot of those uh, materials rolling out for the next year. So a quick summary, and then we'll have to get some questions. Here are some things that you learn while redesigning the design squad again and again. You've got to make some room in someone's mind. You've got to help them learn by doing those things. You've got to spur them on past failure. And you've got to design like you mean it. That's one that I added on the end. And for you guys, too, you have to design like you really care about what you're doing. Um, and that's infectious. You know, when, when kids worked with the designers in the show and, and were, were around the table together making something, that's what sort of carried the day is the fact that they clearly love what they're doing. So hopefully you're in a space right now where you can love what you do. I would encourage you to, to, to share that love with, um, share that enthusiasm with anyone who's a young person who you know um, who's excited about design. Spur them on to do the, do the same. So um, thanks again for listening. I would encourage you also to submit your stuff to Design Squad Nation because we need designers like you to be part of the community to make kids excited about that too. And thanks so much for listening. So we got some time for questions. I don't know if we need this. Can you guys hear me in the back if I just talk? Yeah. Oh, that way. That means you don't need the mic. But I will ask, can you repeat the question or at least summarize it? That yes, I can. Video, so. Questions? Other than the fact that it runs on PBS.org, am I correct? Yes. How are you guys pushing the traffic to the site? I mean, you're saying, you know, with the, the whole, um, um, you know, to win a prize or whatever. How are you guys pushing traffic to that website other than PBS? I'm a stay-at-home dad, so I know. <laughs> Martha speaks, curious George. Yeah, that's right. So the question is, how do we get web traffic to the site um, other than PBS? Well, I'll say PBS is a, is a big one. And PBS Kids and PBS.org are, are huge domains that get tremendous amount of traffic. So most of our traffic comes through that. But the other way to do it is, is through partner organizations. We've, you know, working with, with Make for some promotions, working with Instructables now, working with uh, science museums, after school programs, getting the word out through teachers. I mean, that kind of grassroots sort of approach has been also what we're trying. Um, yeah, so I would say those two, those two things. But certainly PBS.org, not to be underestimated how many kids and how many parents are on those sites every day. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. This is just more of a comment. Okay. Um, it's funny when I hear you talk about failure is okay because, you know, as a, I'm a program manager, so I manage large creative teams. And a lot of our clients now, they want to do things in an agile way, which really almost demands that you kind of fail. <laughs> and fail a little bit to some extent because you go through iterations of designs. And it's, it's interesting because 
it really is something that you have to learn to be okay with because as when I grew up learning, it was always if you want to get it done, you want to get it the first time, you always want to be right the first time. And a lot of our clients still have that kind of attitude, yet they want to engage in a more agile and flexible way of, you know, of being creative and, and building things. So it's just interesting that this is something that's being taught to children now. I, I think it's great because the way that we design now is, is it just you're never going to be right on the first, the first go of it. So. Yeah, that's, that's, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that there's a long way to go before we as a culture or as a profession are okay with the intermediate steps where you show your work and it doesn't work out the first couple times. Um, absolutely right. Yes, down there. Hi, Dave. I'm at Jodhia. Support of WG Base for 30 years, Lincoln Capital. Question for you. Are you doing anything on the radio side, on the sound, uh, verbal side of WG Base to, to use your design concepts to get the... <coughs> Programming on the other side? Uh, the question is about, do we do anything with Design Squad or design on radio? Is that your question? Yes? Yeah. Yes. You know, we haven't yet, but it's a great idea. and We'd love to. I mean, there's, there's a new show um, on Saturday mornings about innovation. It's on GBH right now. Natural Connection just started up, so I think there's something there. It's a good idea. Absolutely. Not yet, but we'd love to. Other questions? Anyone want to share a, a tremendous personal design failure of themselves? No? <laughs> Don't rush to the front. <laughs> Yes. I'm actually a student who went back to school for um, for um, digital media after 30 years. And when I was in school the first time, you if you um, failed the first time, you went back to the beginning and started all over again. And now you take what you failed with and you take the right take the parts that worked out of it and you start from there. So I think it's a, the way that the, the kids are being taught now is different from the way we were taught. Back then. So you're saying you, you make a mistake, it doesn't work out, you start from scratch yeah. again and you build it up from there. Yeah, I mean, I think that what we've seen on the show is that the, part of the, the testing part is, is crucial. And that's something also kids have a hard time with. And frankly, you know, I do too as, as a grown up is to, to look at what we just made and then target the exact parts that aren't working and then focus on those as opposed to just throwing up your hands and throwing out the whole thing or just walking away or saying it's mostly fine. To really understand how the pieces work together and then target those spots that aren't working and fix those. So you're absolutely right. And it's totally key to this process. I think what would be to add to that would be dependent upon the situation. I mean, you could go back and start from scratch and have a totally better idea that works for you. Right, exactly. You could go back, like in that clip we show with the wipe the ray, the right. whiteboard. Whew. It's tough, <laughs> yeah, but it needed to happen because they were, that, you know. yeah, it was early enough on for them. They had to just wipe the slate clean, literally, and, and rebuild their idea. There's a question in the back there, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so it looks like you've redesigned the website several times. Several times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, we do. We, we like to, as often as possible, bring kids into to GBH or go out to schools or after school programs and show them some comps and have them you know, click on some early prototypes and tell us what they think. And it's almost always that we try to be too clever. Like, we're going to call this button, you know, awesomeness. And they're like, why don't you just call it video? Because, <laughs> like, okay, it's a great idea. Video, boom. <laughs> we try to over, you know, over cool and it's just isn't, it's not necessary. So they're really a great reality check. The other reality check is um, sometimes when we design games, you see kids are trying to do it and they're trying to have fun with it, whatever. And the worst feedback to get is to have a kid look up at you and be like, can I be done now? You know, <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the feedback you want. But it's really helpful because it'll tell you straight up when something's not, not working. Yes, sir. Um, I live in India. Um, eight months in a year and four months I travel out. Um, I run a small street fund focused on media, HR, and design. The media and HR people have figured out how to make money. The designers, the two companies that I'm part of, I'm on board. Um, they are the top two companies in India. But one of the complaints I often hear, there's a school in India called NID, National Institute of Design, which is one of the top schools. And we hire mostly from NID. And the, 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 the complaint I often hear from them is that we don't make enough money in design. I don't know if that's true in the US. But how do you inspire some of these kids who are great designers and they don't see a future where they won't make a lot of money? So, yeah, so the question is about the career. How do you make design an appealing career when it's not always going to be a lucrative career path? I think, I think the one is you have to love it, you know, and to show that there are people who just love, and that's a big part of it. It's just enjoying the process of doing it, even when it's hard. 
And then the other part with Design Squad in particular is we try to really tie together design and engineering so that they have the, the aesthetic sensibility, but also you know, the engineering know-how to, to actually make, make an object. And engineering still is a lucrative career path, many different options. We have some other projects for older kids in high school that help them sort of target their interest towards particular kinds of engineering or particular kinds of design. Um, and again, it's showing someone who is just excited about that, about that career and just living it every day and loving that, and, and then showing them how you can sort of get there. So it's not always going to be a, a path to, to big money, but it can be a path to, to happiness in, in your career. And also, I would say, helping change, change the world, even in, your, in a small sense of, of that phrase. Kids really want to do something that's meaningful. And there are a lot of great examples of design and engineering where they've really solved a really important problem for some, some other community or some other engineering challenge. And that really resonates with, with kids as well. Yes? Um, as a hiring manager, when you're talking to people that you, you know, that you might be interested in hiring or that you've just hired, do you ask them and talk to them about how they handle failure? Is that part of something that you're concerned with bringing to your team? Yes. Or <laughs> then we ask them what's what's something that really you know was a, a problem on a team, and how did the team and you in particular deal with that and move past it to solve the problem? I mean that's it's important because we built this <coughs> site. We do our work in small you know teams. I'm sure many of you do, and you have to be able to move past some of that stuff. So yeah, we ask questions like that, and also what really bugs you at work. It's good to just get those bugaboos out in the open <laughs> immediately. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, it was, the question was about, um, in the examples we've, we've given in the, in the stuff we've made, we, we, it seems like it's a uh, purposeful balance between not being, oh, this is a girly thing and this is a, a boy thing and it's sort of more, more neutral or, or uh, across genders. Yeah, it was intentional, and particularly because young, young women are, are lacking in representation in these fields. And so the project and, and the funders who fund this are concerned about that. They want you know, diversity in engineering and diversity in design. Um, so yeah, we, we put a lot of thought into that um, for the TV show and for the website to pick aesthetics that seem to be just fun and appeal to, to many different ages uh, and in both, in both genders as well. Yeah. Over there. Average age of the kids who use our site. Well, PBS Kids in general um, tends to be four to eight range, but Design Squad is maybe goes from six to twelve ish on the web. It's a little, a little older than what's on TV typically. I mean, TV of shows like Curious George and Martha Speaks and Dinosaur Train that are much more pre-K shows. This is a bit older. So yeah, we, we range sort of through um, you know mid to late elementary and sort of up into the beginning of middle school. I mean, this is based on some whatever self-report surveys we, we've gotten. Yeah. Yes. What was your favorite project? My favorite project. Favorite project on the on the show they did. On the show, or that you participated in with this kind of activity. Yeah. Um, you know, one that was the two that I liked the most um, were both in developing countries. One was an earlier episode where they were making a peanut butter grinding maker for Haiti, and the later one that you saw was the playground um, in Nicaragua, because it clicks for kids that there are people who live lives that look different than you, and that you can, you know, no matter, even though you're from different cultures, you can work with them to, to make something together. So that's, that gets me excited, is to see kids thinking about beyond the U.S., uh, the greater world in general. Yes? Um, you know, we're always looking for, for ways to reach older audiences. I can't speak for PBS in general because it involves many, many more producers than just what we do here at GBH, but um, I think that the need is there. You know, it's clear that we need, I think personally, um, I would love to see more shows for middle school age kids. I watched a lot of Carmen San Diego when I was growing up, love that show. Would love to see something like that again. Um, so yeah, and if you have a great idea, you should pitch it and try to get it done. Yes? Um, I have two questions. Um, one is what inspires you as, as a designer, um, besides like, watching the kids and like, inspiring them and motivating them to do things. 
Um, the second one is dealing with how like there's a new trend towards kids who don't watch TV, and they're more like focused on watching certain shows or like watching on Netflix or Hulu. And because like WGBH and PBS is on TV, like kids don't watch that. So how do you kind of reach out to those kind of kids? Okay, two questions were what inspires me as a designer, and the second question was about changing media habits for for kids and shifting to more online viewing than on TV. I'll take the second one first, which is you're absolutely right. You can read all kinds of reports from from the Pew Charitable Trust or from Kaiser Family Foundation or whatever else to show shifting media habits. Those are great reports to see what kids are doing now. And so over the past five years, uh, PBS has poured a tremendous amount into online video viewing, um, PBS YouTube channels, uh, apps. Because um, we, we, we realize that the kids are watching things in little bits of time when they have time available with a parent in the car, if, they're, if, if they have a chance to do that um, on the computer. And so even on Design Squad, we, that's why we're shifting to this more short form video format, those clips of the air hockey table of the sticky notes kind of thing, so that it fits with that, that style of media habit. You can still have a great experience, even if it's three minutes in time and it's on a computer. You don't got to sit down for a half an hour TV show. So we're, we're trying to keep up with that. I think we are. Um, and we'll see how this next season goes. Other shows, same kind of deal, focusing on online content as well. But I will say the TV ain't dead yet. Um, a tremendous amount of people watch TV. It's nearly universal in everyone's home, so we're not going to be giving up broadcast anytime soon. Uh, what inspires me? I think it's working with, you said, besides working with kids. But I see, when I see design that really solves um, a problem in someone's life, it solves a sanitation issue, you know, non exciting issues, but it like, makes a huge difference in someone's day to day life. That gets me super excited, you know, learning something new, seeing something again in a developing country where they solved some problem before. It's just, you know, that's what it's about, for me at least. Yes? How do you balance educational kids programming versus well, yeah, the question was, so GBH produces, um, uh, it's one of the largest producers of media for, for PBS on TV and on the radio online. That's true. And how we balance fun stuff with educational stuff? Compared to the mainstream media? Compared to mainstream. Well, we are who we are because all of our stuff has some sort of educational mission tied to it. Um, period. You know, that's just, that's, that's the deal. And we, we try to not make it boring. You know, we try to make it fun because it is fun to learn new things. So, yeah, it's a balance. How much, how many facts can you cram in there? You know, how much detail do you want to get into teaching math at a certain age? But if we, we put a lot of time working with advisors to find out what's developmentally appropriate so kids aren't like overwhelmed by the material and they're watching a Martha Speaks episode, for example, it's at the right mark for what they are. And then it doesn't feel like it's so much work for the kid. It just feels like it's a natural learning process and fun to watch these stories. And we spend a lot of time thinking about that, a lot of time developing shows that are going to, and testing shows, and testing websites so that we're seeing, yes, they're enjoying it, they're getting it, we evaluate it after the fact, do they learn something? It's that process that makes us able to, to do that um, without having to just put like a thousand explosions in a show to make it good, you know. <laughs> Unless it's a show about the science of explosions, in that case it's fine. <laughs> One more question. Anybody else? I just have a comment. I mean, it's a compliment to you guys, I think, not only the fact, I mean, to her point uh, regarding the, the media, be it online or TV, I like the fact that the kids are watching that, viewing that, learning from it, but then as well going out and doing it themselves, being physically active, but which I think is very important in today's day and age. Yeah, totally. We want kids saying it's good to go out and actually do something, not just absorb, but actually do. Ab we couldn't agree more. That's what we hope for. Thank you all so much for being designers and engineers and being here. So thanks all for coming. I know I'm inspired to now go make my air hockey table. <laughs> my wife's going to be like. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for waking up early and coming to Creative Mornings. And like I said before, stay tuned. DesignMuseumBoston.org for all the cool exhibitions and events we have coming up. And have a great rest of your day. Thanks.